everybody, this is Jason. Welcome to Liberty Live. Today, we're going to be discussing Gad. Who is Gad and why are we discussing him today in Liberty Live? Very simple. Gad is son seven out of 12 from the patriarch Jacob, surnamed Israel, who was the grandson of Abraham, making Gad the great-grandson of Abraham. Gad means good luck or fortune. But what we're going to learn in this video, it has nothing to do with luck at all. For in God, there is no luck. Everything is at the mercy of God's foreknowledge and at his immediate and present will. In this video, we're going to learn about the altar of witness, a city of refuge, and the Mesha Stele. What's a Mesha Stele? Stay tuned for this video teaching. Now, Gad, son number seven, brother to Asher, is son of Jacob and Zilpah. Zilpah was a handmaiden of Leah. And after Leah stopped bearing children, she gave her handmaiden Zilpah to, Z to Jacob, or Jacob. And when she bore the son Gad, she said, Ah, at last, good fortune, good favor, and good luck have come back to me because I have borne my husband and master more children through my maidservant. Now, Jewish tradition later goes on to say that Zilpah ended up being a wife of Jacob, not just a maidservant. And we know that Gad was brother to Asher in the line of half-brothers making the 12 confederate tribes of Israel. Remember, there were 12 brothers and one sister, Dina. Sometimes the logo for Gad will look like a tent or a wall. The blessing from Moses comes from Deuteronomy chapter 33, and it reads, Of Gad, he said, Blessed is he who enlarges Gad. He is like a lion crouching, tearing apart from limb and shoulder. He will choose the best land for himself and receive the portion that was due to the commander. He came in with the heads of all the people, and with Israel he executed the justice of the Lord, even the judgments of Israel. So this means that Gad is going to have the, one of the best lots of land, a land reserved for the commander like the land for Joshua. He also is going to go on ahead of the people, which means he was a head, a servant head, a servant leader going before them. We're going to see how this literally panned out. And also it says he's like a crouching lion, which means that he is going to overwhelm all of his enemies and all of his adversaries every single time. Now, the blessing from Jacob said raiders will raid Gad, but he will raid at their heels, meaning that he is going to counterattack greater than the original attack. An example of this is when David went to Philistia when he was being pursued by Saul, son of Kish, from the tribe of Benjamin, or Israel's first king. When Saul was in pursuit of David, David finally fled to Philistia, even behind enemy lines. And he went to the commanders of the Philistine army and said, I will serve you and stay here with you. He stayed in Ziglag. And one day, the Philistines went to war against Israel, and David volunteered, though he was, a, though he was bluffing, they thought he was really going to serve them because Saul now became his enemy and he became a stench to Israel because of Saul son of Kish. But the commander said, unless we go over to Israel and David turns and then now is at our heels, let's let him stay back. So they rejected David and he said, why can't I go with you? And they said, please just stay here. I know you're a loyal man. So when David went back, he found out that the Amalekites did a raid on Ziglag burned the city with fire, took their wives and their children and all their belongings. And so David's mighty men were ready to stone David, and he said, wait. He sought the Lord. He said, bring me the ephod so I can know that I know that I know basically the will of God. And he said, God, shall I pursue the Amalekites? And the Lord said, yes, pursue and overtake them. So David and his mighty men pursued the Amalekites, and in pursuit they found an Egyptian who was a slave and servant left behind by Amalek who was sick. For three days and three nights he was without water, and he found David, and David said, tell me where the men went. And the guy said, promise me that you won't kill me. And the David said, I promise you your life will remain with you. And so the Egyptian led David in the direction where the Amalekites fled, and David and his mighty men found them dancing over the victory, the spoils, and the booty that they had received from David from Ziglag. A mighty man is David, and they thought they defeated him and made spoil and fools of all of him and his uh, and all of him in his encampment. And so David, because they were dancing, utterly overwhelmed them. They, they destroyed them, they captured their wives, their children, their booty back, and booty are spoils of war, and they got all of the wealth from Amalek. This is called the national transfer of wealth, when the wealth of one kingdom or nation or army is transferred to another, 
in one single act, action, day, or transaction. So now David raids, he was raided, he raided at the heels and ended up in a much better position because of the favor and the fortune of God. Not luck, beloved, it was by the hand of God. This is what the prophecy of Gad means. He will be raided, but he will raid at their heels. Now, we see this in the life of David, the prophecy fulfilling in the life of Gad. Now, Gad, the name Gad, Gimel, Aleph, Dalet, Gad, meaning favor and or fortune, is Gimel, Camel, which means travel, and Dalet means door, which opens both ways. So the name Gad actually means that, that we're going to travel by the power of the Spirit through an open door. It'll open and close on both sides by the power of the Spirit. And what we see is that originally when we were nomadic people, we got the name Hapiru, which means to cross over. Many people believe this is where the name Hebrew comes from, Hapiru, because these Hapiru warring like nomadic people crossed over where they cross over the Sea of Reeds, the Yom Suf. We all had to cross over. And this is what Gad means, a people who will move in the spirit, who will cross over through the open door. Now, Gad ended up being the open door for all of the tribes to enter the promised land. We're going to get there in a minute. Now, before we could go to the promised land, we were going to go straight up, but we ended up going around by the king's highway through Edom and Moab and then across the Jordan. And Gad stayed there on the east side of the Jordan with Gad, Reuben, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. They stayed there because they had many people and much cattle in the land. The fertile plain of the Jordan Valley was unbelievable. Perfect for cattle, perfect for people. It was, it was very safe, fertile, blessed, beautiful land. Remember in the prophecy, he has the land of a commander. So this is one of the apex, A-plus choice parcels of land that ends up falling to Gad by the favor of God. Remember, Joshua cast lots in Joshua 18 to decide who got the pieces of land. Now, because he wanted to settle on the other side of the Jordan, of which Moses said nothing about, said, how is it? And do your own thing. And, and Gad said, no, 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 we're not rebelling. This land for us, our people, and our cattle is, is best for the agricultural uh, gifts that we have. And it was a fertile land. This is where Gilead was in the Bible. Gilead is the balm of Gilead in Jeremiah, a place of medicine, a place of healing, a place of abundance, a place of prosperity. Well, Gad said, this is not our desire to rebel, but this is a plenteous land. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to dress for battle and we'll go across the Jordan with you and walk everyone, everyone, all the tribes to their allotted land and defend them and secure the land and only when they are safe, sound, tucked in, resting for bed almost, then we're going to go back to our land and secure our place. First we'll stand and then we'll sit. We'll stand till everyone else sits, then we'll go back and sit. I was appeased and, and granted him this underneath God's provision. So Gad sees everyone for war. By the way, Gad was very strong. Remember, it says he goes in at the head of the people. Remember the name of Gad, the open door, the door of the spirit to travel. So Gad opens the door. They cross over the Jordan. Now, they crossed over the Jordan. This is a famous picture behind me of James de Sot when the, when the ark is crossing over the Jordan during the reign of Joshua. Now, the reason this is so important is because when Moses was in head, in, the head of the people in charge, God opened the Sea of Reeds for us, the Yom Su. Now remember, when God gives the mantle to Moses, he crosses the Red Sea, the Sea of Reeds, on dry ground. So now that God gives the mantle through Moses to Joshua, does there another body of water that parts to show the same authority is given? Yes, the Jordan River parts, the ark stops in the middle, everyone goes over on dry ground. Joshua says, take 12 memorial stones, one for each tribe, so that when your children ask where these stones meet, they're going to say this is the day the Jordan stood still. Also, Joshua's leadership is now authenticated and corroborated by God himself. So what's amazing about this is a kindred story in Elijah and Elisha. Elisha asked Elijah for two parts of his spirit. And Elisha said to Elijah, I'll follow you. And Elijah said, I'm with God. Whether you follow me, it's up to you. But what you asked is hard. If you're with me on the day I depart, then possibly it will be so. And he was. They go to the Jordan River. Elijah takes his cloak, strikes the river, the river opens, they cross over on dry ground. Immediately the chariots of fire come, pick up Elijah and take him to heaven. His mantle falls to earth. Elisha grabs the mantle, receives the double portion, and what does he say? Now where is the God of Elijah? To test this out, he touches Elijah's mantle to the Jordan River and it opens up for Elisha also. He crosses back over on dry ground. So 
as the river opened for Elisha, as it should have if he had the authority of Elijah, because it opened for Elijah, so should the river have opened for Joshua if he was in the authority of Moses, the water parts. Now, for you and I, this is amazing because Jesus has told us to cross over from death to life, from sins to sons, from sorrow to salvation, right? And how do we do this? We also cross over through the waters of baptism, the waters of repentance, the waters of remission, and we get the Holy Spirit, that spirit that's an open door to God's kingdom. The, the way in, beloved, is by obedience to Jesus Christ. And he said, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born again of water and of spirit. Well, we were born in the water when our mother's water broke. And we're born again when we cross over the waters of baptism. Just like the earth started in Genesis 1. The earth was void and without form. Genesis 1, chapter 2, the Holy Spirit was hovering over the waters. And then God said, let there be and there was. So God used the crossing over the water to create the world and all that therein is. He created us in our mother's womb. Before you were in our mother's womb, like Jeremiah, I knew you and appointed you as a prophet to the nations while you were in the water. And you came out of the water to be born. You come out of the water to be born again. We came out of the water from slaves to sons. Then we came out of the water to go from not a people to a people, not a promise to a promise, not an inheritance to an inheritance in the promised land through the open door of the Spirit of God. We who were a traveling nomadic people now had a home. This is the beauty of Gad. The beauty of Jesus Christ is revealed in all of the tribes, beloved, how the glory of Jesus goes before us, secures a place in us, in heaven and on earth, rolls up his sleeves, puts his arms on the cross and his feet, willingly subjects himself to public disgrace so that we could publicly triumph over the enemy. The enemy gave his best and it wasn't good enough blood because Jesus rises from the dead, takes on sin so you and I who sinned and fell short of the glory of God could take on his righteousness and walk in the inheritance as the children of God in its freedom and the original destiny that God purposed for Adam in the garden. Prior to the fall, we may now walk with God in the cool of the night in the place of inheritance, in the place of promise, in the place of favor because of Jesus Christ. Now, I told you about the cities of refuge. There were six cities of refuge, Kadesh, Shechem, Hebron, Golan, Ramah, and Bezer. Now, one of these was in the city of Gad. And what a city of refuge is, is when a manslayer accidentally kills a man, they call him a manslayer, when a man accidentally kills another man, and this is the example that Torah gives. Two guys are in a forest chopping wood, and a guy with an ax rears his ax back to get ready to chop the wood, and the ax had the iron ax head falls off the handle and, and flies in the air and hits the other guy in the head, he dies on accident. He has the right to be avenged, life for life, blood for blood, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. But because it was an accident, he has the legal right to flee to a city of refuge, which is a divinely protected area, a city that is saved for God for acts of mercy until the manslayer goes to trial or till the death of the high priest. Then and only then can he return back to his house and live and dwell in safety. These cities were cities of mercy to protect the innocent so that blood would not be shed on purpose for blood that was shed on accident. So that the revenge is not refuting the justice and the mercy of God, but that an accident can be an accident and that what is on purpose can be on purpose. These are the cities of refuge and one of them was in the territory of Gad, making also in his strength an allotted portion of mercy. For remember, mercy triumphs over judgment. The altar of witness. Now, the altar of witness in Gad, the altar of witness is that Gad, because they're on the east side of the Jordan, they start thinking ahead, Gad, Reuben, and half tribe of Manasseh, and they said, in the future, what if the tribes, because of the inheritance's name on the other side of the Jordan, are going to think that, who are we? What do we have to do with Israel? What do we have to do with the inheritance? Because nothing was mentioned on the east side of the Jordan. And so they make a replica altar of the brazen altar. Look at this here from the tabernacle. The altar is four and a half feet tall by seven and a half feet long by seven and a half feet long. This altar was responsible for all the burnt offerings, all the sacrifices, and all of the uh, guilt offerings, fellowship offerings, sin offerings, and, uh, and burnt offerings, and peace offerings for the nation of Israel. Now Gad makes a replica altar, and when Phineas, the son of Eleazar, finds out with Joshua and the warring tribes, they all dress for battle and come basically to Gad's doorstep. 
And they say, what is this that you've done to rebel against God? Didn't we learn our lesson in the wilderness? And Gad says, no, 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 we're not rebelling. And they go, then what's this altar? You know that God said only where my name dwells will you offer sacrifices and nowhere else. You can't do your own thing. That is rebellion and insubordination. And Gad said, no, we're not breaking faith. We're not doing our own thing. This is an altar of witness. It's a memorial. We're not using this for burnt offerings. We never have and we never will. This is so that one day when your sons look at our sons and say, what portion do you have with Jacob or with Israel, that they will see this altar and remember that we are of the same blood, of the same creed, of the same promise. How did you get this altar? Why does it look like ours? Same dimension, same material, same size, same shape, same everything because we are part of you, we are one with you, and we have no desire at all to rebel, but we don't want to be excluded because of the boundary line of demarcation of the Jordan. And at saying this, they, the people of Israel go, oh, praise God, we thought you were rebelling, you're not, let God's peace abide, let God's favor abide, we accept this altar, let it be memorial, and they went back to their tents and everyone had peace. This happened in the territory and tribe of Gad. Also, the Mesha Stele. Now, what is the Mesha Stele? The Mesha Stele, is something that looks like the Rosetta Stone, if you know what that is. Now, the Rosetta Stone was a stele, and it's a it's a rock like a tombstone. Now, most tombstones have the life of someone in the epitaph. An epitaph is like a summary sentence of their whole life. There's a lot of that in the Book of Kings and Chronicles, like in this king, like Josiah, there was no other king like him who did what was right in the eyes of the Lord like his father David did, or there was no other king like him, that there was a fire burned in his memory, or there was not a fire burned in his memory, or he did wicked things against the Lord, or he did awesome and honorable things towards the Lord. That's an epitaph. That goes on the tombstone. But these type of steles had military conquests and historic data from reigning kings. And so the Rosetta Stone, for example, was some of the Egyptian hieroglyphs with two other types of language saying the same sentence, which is unusual, but it allowed us, the same paragraph rather, to decipher hieroglyphics. It was an amazing archeological find. And so we found one in Moab, the Mesha Steles from King Mesha, a Moabite king. Now remember the Moabites and the Edomites were ultimately descendants of Lot, through whom which Ruth comes. And this Mesha Stele said that Gad and his god Yahweh overtook the Moabites and the Moabites ended up paying tribute to Gad. Now, what this looks like biblically is a Caesarean and vassal covenant. The Caesarean is the supreme party, the vassal is the subordinate. We underwent this with Babylon under King Zedekiah and he rebelled against Babylon and stopped paying tribute, which ended up in conflict with Nebuchadnezzar and Zedekiah. We also know that in the biblical era of the New Testament that Rome was a Caesarean to Judea, a vassal, and we ended up having to pay tax and tribute to Caesar, right? And so we understand what this is about, that Joshua commanded us and Moses and God to overwhelm the people in the area because they were overly wicked. Now, these were not just people that had some other belief system. They were sacrificing babies, worshiping demons, doing lewd practices. If they had their way, there would be no moral compass to survive in the world. Remember when God chose us, Hebrews, as a people, he said, it's not because of anything you did, it's because you're simply less wicked than all the other nations so that we would never be prideful about God's divine selection for us to become the light of the world, a nation of priests and kings, a kingdom of priests for the nation of our God. Now, the Meshistile goes on to say later that Moab later regained their independence, but they paid tribute to Gad, which means Gad did his job. He, he basically enslaved them. They had to pay tribute to Gad knowing that Yahweh was a God of all gods and that he was supremely in charge. This, this stele corroborates the name Yahweh and the tribe of Gad's historic archaeological confirmation that they existed as a tribe, where they said they did, when they said they did, how they said they did. It's a beautiful and amazing find that was again found in Moab. It's now in Lovern in a museum in London. Also, we have the prophet Gad. Now, Gad the prophet ministered alongside of Nathan and Samuel. When Samuel got old, Nathan kicked in. When Nathan got older, Gad kicked in. Now, Gad is responsible for several things. One, when David made a mistake and made the census without God's permission or approval or um, initiation, he wanted to number the people for war. And they said, why are you doing this? We've never lost a war yet. Number one, number two, God didn't say to do this. Number three, there's not a war on our hands. And David said, just do it. 
Well, anyway, through Gad, God disciplined him and said, I'm going to give you three choices. One, you can have seven months of famine. Two, three days of pestilence. And three, you can be pursued by your enemies for three and four months. And David said, only let me fall into the hand of God because his mercy is great. And so he had three days of pestilence. The angel of the Lord slayed 70,000 men. And Gad said, David, go to the uh, threshing floor of Ornon the Jebusite and make an altar to the Lord that the angel of the Lord's she sword be sheathed. In other words, to stop the plague, that the mercy will stop the judgment. So David goes to Ornon and says, I'll buy your cattle. I'll buy the land. I need to make an altar to God. And Ornon says, whatever you want, king, I'm going to give it to you freely. And David says the famous sentence, I will not give what costs me nothing. So he buys the cattle at full price, buys the land for full price from the threshing floor, which is what separates the wheat and the chaff, a threshing floor. It's where we separate the wheat and the chaff to end up making flour, which makes bread. And Oranon gave these things to David. He received the money for them. And David now buys these things, makes an altar, makes a sacrifice. The angel sees and stays his hand and the pestilence is over. Now, it ends up being that the threshing floor of Ornon the Jebusite is on Mount Moriah, across the street from Zion, Zion, the city of David. Up until now, David brought the Ark of the Covenant and all the things of the tabernacle to the tent of David. This is prophesied in Acts that, that the tent of David will be rebuilt, the fallen tent of David. The tent of David is the tabernacle when it was brought to Zion, surrounded by 24-7 praise and worship. But the presence of God made Mount Zion what it is in the city of David. But then his son, in 1 Kings chapter 8, takes the ark and all of the furniture from the tent of David out of the city of David onto Mount Moriah. Now, Mount Moriah, on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite, Moriah means Yah, Yahweh, Mori, teacher, Yahweh will teach us. The mountain where Yahweh will teach us is where the first temple was built. We went from tent to tabernacle to temple on Mount Moriah, out of the city of David onto Mount Moriah, what happened here? On Mount Moriah is where Abraham was going to offer up Itzhak and found a ram in the thicket as an archetype of Yeshua, our sacrifice, our atonement, our freedom, our inheritance, our lineage. It is also where Jacob laid his head down and said, I didn't know God was just none other than the house of God. I saw angels ascending and descending to the house of God and calls the place Bethel. Beth means house, like Bethlehem, house of bread. Beth is house, El is God, Bethel, the house of God. It later on is taken over by the Jebusites. And when David goes and captures Jerusalem from the Jebusites, it ends up being that they were squatting there for a number of years because Abraham made an altar, putting his flag in the ground first, securing the land as a designated inheritance for us. Jacob does the same. So we have presence of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Isaac, because he was going to be offered up by Abraham, all on this location where the temple of God is to be built. This is not a coincidence, beloved. This is divine providence. So now the temple is going to be built in this place. And when the temple is erected, it was Gad who said, David, put the musicians here on the Dukhan. A Dukhan is a semi-cylindrical staircase going up like bleachers for a choir. Right when you walk in the Nicanor Gate after the 15 steps to the place of prayer in the court of Israel, it says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Well, the gate is the Nicanor gate. You start giving thanks because all the priests, the Kohenite, the Levites, and the choir are giving their praise, thanks, songs, and cantations to God at his house, at his temple, towards his face, towards his presence, right in front of the altar. And this is why churches, synagogues, and auditoriums get the half cylindrical staircase with choir ideas because... It was given to us by God in God's house, spoken through Gad the prophet, so that God would be surrounded in praise and worship. And when we approach God, we would approach him with utmost thanks and praise. Now, the courts of thanksgiving, those courts are the Azara. Azara means to help. Also, the word Azariah, coming from Daniel's contemporaries, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, which were surnamed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Azariah, Yah is my help, Azar help, the place of help is the place where God helps us and we minister to God or serve and give to God and to his people. This was all spoken by the prophet Gad. Now the stone of Gad is a diamond or an emerald and it is incredibly hard on the MOH scale. Diamond is used to cut through the hardest material in the world. Diamond is the hardest on the MOH scale of all elements. If you want to cut through stone, masonry, marble, tile, ceramic, glass, 
or steel, you get a saw blade, a drill bit, or a uh, any type of blade, and you put it in epoxy or adhesive, and you dip it in diamond dust. And the diamond dust is able to cut through anything, no matter what it is. This is the same thing with GAD. GAD was able to cut through anything to get us where we needed to be, and by his strength, we were served, we were secured, we were satisfied, because God's favor was with GAD. And Jesus Christ comes to the earth to secure an inheritance for you and me, that we could cross over into his freedom, into his promise. And just like Gad, he goes first and then comes back. Even Jesus goes into the waters of baptism, making an example for us to follow. Going before us. Remember, Jesus will never ask you to do anything he's not himself willing to do or hasn't already done or would not take your hand himself. Going before you leading you into the place of victory. This is the beauty of our king, whose dominion is from sea to shining sea and from coast to coast, from the rivers to the ends of the earth. He is Jesus, from the lowest of kings to the highest of men. He is the head of all the confederate tribes that were and will be. Jesus Christ unifies Scythian, Greek, slave, free, bond, male, female. Uh, there's only one in Christ Jesus, one nation under God, Achat, the Benai Israel, Benai Achat, the Israel nation is one nation under God by Jesus Christ, the King of all kings. His rule and his kingdom shall never end, beloved. He is the one who whispers to Gad the prophet. He is the one who gives Gad the tribe strength. He is the one that gave salvation to Yahshua, Joshua, after he goes through Moses. Yahshua, Jesus Christ, means the salvation of God. And this salvation has gone before you and me to make a way, beloved, into the freedom of God, into the inheritance of God to secure our place in the promised land, a fertile land in salvation. The kingdom of God has come to our hand. How do we know this? Because the authority of the king is within us. It comes to our hand. We know that we know that we know that God is good and that he's given us a portion amongst Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He said many will come from the east and west and dine at the table of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We could not do that unless Jesus rose from the dead becoming sin so that we who knew no sin could become his righteousness, moving in resurrected power. Beloved, remember with all the tribes, as long as you don't compromise, your victory is guaranteed. Why? Because God has gone before you. He's already fought the battle. All you have to do is role play, do the steps he says to do, and victory shall await those who yield their self to the risen Christ, to the risen King, who bow their knee to the only authority in heaven and earth, that is worthy of all praise, all honor, and all thanks. He is Jesus Christ. He is the one who gives Gad life. He is the one who gives history and corroboration to the word of God. And he is the one that liveth still. And it is in his name that the Gentiles will trust. Both Jews and Gentiles alike will put their hope in him. In Jesus' name.